an interesting subspeciality. Cataract always interesting. And most of the ophthalmologists are interested to attend the sessions of cataract. Uh, is it okay to start Dina or still? Dina from Mar Vision. Yes, yes, doctor, please, please proceed. Can we start now? Yes, doctor, please. Is, is Dr. Mohammed Hisham will join or uh, not yet? Not yet, doctor. Okay, so just to know if he, maybe he, he will give his talk or not, okay? So we will start now uh, this uh, interesting session of uh, uh, cataract surgery in extreme eyes. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, the welcome everybody, welcome the, our uh, eminent speakers and welcome also the uh, participants from everywhere. And uh, we uh, invite Dr. David Chang from uh, California to give the first talk. I will not give the title. I will leave him to give the title. It is very long title. Better to he, he himself to explain it. Please, Dr. David Chang. All right. Well, uh, good evening from California. It's nice to be joining uh, with you here. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show one case to illustrate an extremely hard cataract and the approach. Uh, but it's a case that has uh, multiple uh, other problems. So I am a consultant for J&J, &J, but nothing specific uh, to this case. You know, uh, rock hard lenses are challenging, but they're challenging because often there are other problems. Uh, they typically have weak zonules just from the weight of the lens. Uh, frequently, there's a small pupil. Uh, sometimes the chamber has become very shallow, particularly because the lens is so sizable. There's often been prior surgery, and so there may be other ocular comorbidities, uh, such as with the fundus. So this is one such case. It's a patient who has had in this left eye angle closure glaucoma. And it's been assumed that, you know, he's lost some vision because of that. And uh, so no one's been interested in removing the cataract. He has one good eye, but this is the left eye that I'm showing you. You can see there's sort of stromal uh, atrophy consistent with angle, acute angle closure glaucoma. The pupil doesn't dilate, but this is what's unique. Uh, this is the good eye and, and I, it's easier to photograph the fact that there's virtually no anterior chamber. So this is something we occasionally see. It's not common, but you look here and there is almost no anterior chamber. And just imagine now we have this rock hard lens. Uh, so what is the approach in a case uh, like this? Well, we went ahead and really wanted surgery so uh, the minute I put in just a little bit of viscoelastic, the eye is rock hard. So the technique that I would use here, if the eye is not too soft, is a pars plana sclerotomy. And I go three millimeters back. And I use a disposable MVR blade. I aim posterior toward the optic nerve. And I'm going to then do a limited vitreous tap, I call it. It's basically a small gauge vitrector and I just take out a little bit of vitreous. Now I don't want to make the eye too soft. So I kind of palpate the eye. And when it's starting to just get a little soft, I can stop and now fill the anterior chamber. And now I can see the lens and the iris go backward and I have normal depth. Now the second challenge is we don't have just posterior synechiae. The iris stroma has been adherent to the lens because the lens is so forward. So when I go in with the spatula, look at the bottom of your screen, you will see that it's very transparent. You see the spatula through the iris? That's how atrophic it is. So this is going to tear very, very easily. And that's why I'm going to not use iris retractors. I'm going to instead use a Malugan ring uh, because I think that while the case is going on, it's less likely that the pupil gets stretched any further. I do have to do this very carefully now because when I put that last 
corner in it will stretch the pupil as you'll see here but the advantage of the Malugan ring unlike the iris hooks is the pupil will not get further stretched inadvertently during the surgery now i have no red reflex so there's this is the point at which now the pupil's larger i can put in my tripan blue dye try to get right up against the capsule a little bit just under the pupillary margin uh, because, you know, pearl number one is we have to be able to uh, see. And I'm going to use, of course, a dispersive viscoelastic here. So the capsulorexis is when you start to assess the zonular stability. And I see a little bit of movement, but it doesn't look too bad. So I'm just uh, carefully going to uh, try to make the rexis large enough. But remember, again, that I want to have it... Uh, intact. And this is would have been very difficult had I not deepened the chamber. Uh, the other problem, of course, is if I don't had not deepened the chamber, we have a, a, a tremendous amount of endothelial cell loss uh, with such trying to do phaco in essentially it would be like an anterior chamber uh, phaco. So after the rexus is complete, we'll do the hydro dissection and uh, then we always spin the nucleus. And this is the problem that we're gonna have here. I cannot turn this nucleus. Now I know the lens is large, but you usually can turn the lens, especially if it's dense. And if it isn't turning, you have to suspect weak zonules, that there's not enough uh, peripheral counter traction on the capsule and zonules to turn it. So what should I do? I guess I can start to debulk the lens a little bit and maybe try to hydro dissect again and try to turn it again. But if you force it, you can create a zonular dialysis very easily. So my strategy is actually going to be to at some point put in capsule retractors to give me the peripheral uh, and the capsular stability and counter traction. Sometimes you use two instruments to try to turn the lens, but it is not a turning. So I know that with a dense lens like this, the zonules are usually weak. It's a question of how much. And so I'm going to put in capsule retractors and there are many different kinds. I'm trying to hydro dissect again, uh, but I'm going to use, uh, we uh, get ours from microsurgical technologies and it's a double stranded uh, loop. Uh, and gives support peripherally to the fornix of the capsular bag. I'm gonna put three of these in and think of it as artificial zonules that holds and supports the lens in the uh, axial direction, the AP direction. It keeps the peripheral capsule a little more taut, uh, but also it anchors it. So now, instead of wanting to turn with the lens, the capsular bag is fixed to the sclera. And now with two instruments, especially, I can pivot on the phaco tip. I can finally turn it. Now I have done a half of a trough. I've sculpted half of a trough. And with a dense lens, that's deep enough now to get uh, uh, an anchor with my phaco tip. And this is uh, the sharp Chang vertical chopper. And so I'm using my central trench to get very deep. I'm lifting a little bit with the phaco tip using high vacuum. And this has a sharp point on it. Uh, and I'm de uh, in incising the nucleus while at the same time, I slightly lift the fragment with the phaco tip. And this creates this shearing motion uh, that can, in this case, transmit all the way to the back of the lens. But the key is I did a half of a trench, just like I was sculpting, but I did not complete the trench. And once I um, rotated 180 degrees, uh, it meant that I could get the phaco tip deep enough. Now remember, this lens is so large, it's like the equivalent of maybe three normal nuclei in terms of the volume. So you will see me frequently pause and re-coat the endothelium uh, with the v dispersive viscoelastic. This happens to be helon endocote. And now I have switched from my 
um, vertical chopper to a horizontal chopper because when I get these little pieces here, um, I make them smaller and smaller. And if you have non-longitudinal ultrasound like Ozil uh, or Ellipse, uh, this is when you want to use it with these fragments. The other thing is uh, I'm going to try to really be slower than normal when I get these pieces. Uh, there's a tendency to relax and then to use uh, a lot of ultrasound to make it go faster. But this is the point where you get the endothelial cell loss, in my opinion, because if you go too fast, the pieces are too large, they bounce away from the phaco tip. And uh, notice again, I'm going to re-coat the endothelium. Now, notice here I'm going underneath the nucleus. That's important because as more of the posterior capsule is exposed, remember the zonules are weak and that posterior capsule is not as taut as it normally is. So this viscoelastic vault is not only pushing the capsule away, but it's stretching the capsular bag. And I'm putting the fake of the chopper underneath. It's stretching the capsular bag so it won't come up to the phaco tip. Notice how with just this last little piece, this is still when you can aspirate the posterior capsule. So I paused and I totally, again, put dispersive in, which uh, resists aspiration to stretch the capsular bag and to then uh, put it on stretch uh, to essentially take the place of the zonules normally putting the capsular bag on stretch. So the um, INA is easier because I have not put in the CTR, and if you can, try to use the capsule retractors and then delay the CTR until the cortex has been removed so it won't be trapped. Notice I aim to the left so that it opens to my right, and you notice that I left the capsule retractors in until after the CTR has been put in. That's because just inserting the CTR causes some lateral displacement of the capsular bag and the CTR is really there to um, uh, prevent the capsular bag from being displaced. I'm just using a, a three-piece monofocal. You could also do a single-piece design, but I like the three-piece because the haptics also provide some stretch along with the CTR. And uh, you don't have to be uh, quite as uh, compulsive as me but I like to make the uh, rexus diameter a little bit larger uh, because it will contract with weak zonules, even with the CTR. And you can see that with the Malugan ring, I can expose this area without just making the pupil wider, I'm actually moving the pupil. And now when, you, when I remove this, let's look at the iris stroma and you can see how this is uh, sort of the most gentle way, I think, to open things up. Uh, and then finally we remove, and I use the cohesive here because it's just easier to remove, but uh, we'll close the sclerotomy with a single 8O vicral suture. And uh, then we have finished the case. So the key here was that uh, vitreous tap. Now, naturally there's a little bit of corneal edema, but uh, the cornea is here at one week. You can see just how crystal clear and compact this is, uh, despite the very narrow angles, the small pupil, the zonulopathy, and that extremely shallow chamber. So all of these techniques combine to provide a good cornea. Now, surprisingly, even though there was some field depression and optic neuropathy, this eye uh, got to 20, 30 plus after being, you know, basically given up for dead. And because of the anisometropia and the cataract in the other eye, the patient had surgery. And then I did exactly the same thing with the vitreous tap uh, to deepen the chamber uh, and we did well. So again, uh, this is uh, the uh, principles. Now, um, when you have a rock hard lens, it's all about protecting the endothelium. So let's just review what we did. Uh, you, you could have done an extra cap, uh, but then you have a little bit of the risk of uh, supracortal hemorrhage. We did the vitreous tap, multiple applications of OVD, the, ver the vertical and horizontal chopping, and then the uh, 
viscoelastic at the end. Uh, my last slide, this is uh, my paper presenting four cases for the, the first report of this was in 2001 and I presented at the uh, 2000 ASCRS meeting, this technique of doing the vitreous tap and it's important not to aim toward the lens. You must aim posterior. It's important not to make the eye too soft. Uh, and you only need to remove just a little bit. But because you're using the vitrector rather than the needle, you're not going to end up uh, um, you know, uh, putting too much uh, traction on the vitreous and causing a retinal tear. Uh, and you cannot, do, you don't want to do this if the axial length is lower than 20. So a nanophthalmic eye, you don't know where the pars plana ends. But if you have an eye that's uh, 20 or, or above, uh, so most of these eyes are 21, you can safely go back three millimeters to do this. And it's not often, but it's a lifesaver uh, when you do this technique. So thank you very much. Dr. Willem, I think you're on mute. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. David. Uh, it's a nice presentation. Uh, I would like to ask uh, you, would you implant a three-piece lens in the sulcus and do the optic capture? I learned myself this technique from you well, uh, instead of just to, to ensure better centration on the long term. Yes, I think that's a really good question. So the question is, if you have zonulopathy, you know, the CTR by itself uh, won't help you. And I think in this case, I felt it was okay. But if you have um, any question or significant zonulopathy, a three-piece in the sulcus gives you additional two-point fixation where the haptics are touching uh, the ciliary body, especially if you orient the lens from the three o'clock to nine o'clock position. That's when we have our lateral saccades. And if you try that, you'll be really impressed with the stability. I then capture the optic with the CCC. That prevents contracture. It centers the lens and it prevents it from rotating because often you may have a zonular dialysis that is occult and then you don't have to change the IOL power. So, so thank you for mentioning that. Thank you very thank you much. Very, thank you very much, Dr. David. And thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for your comments. Uh, I, uh, I hope that we'll have time at the end to have an interesting discussion because uh, all the interesting cases needs discussion. So the next, now I can see Dr. Yuri and Dr. Mohammed Hisham, they joined us. Welcome. Everyone. Very good. So we have the full, uh, full speakers and, uh, and panelists. Uh, now Dr. Ali Hafiz will give the second talk of cataract extraction in angle closure glaucoma. Dr. Ali Hafiz from Canada. Please, Dr. Ali. Yes, thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you again for the invitation. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna be speaking today about uh, cataract extraction in angle closure glaucoma or rather cataract extraction as a treatment for angle closure uh, glaucoma. I'm a glaucoma specialist, so uh, I have no financial uh, disclosure. And um, during the coming uh, 15 minutes, I'm gonna try to answer these four questions. Uh, does cataract extraction help in resolving a residual angle closure after laser um, peripheral iridotomy? And uh, second question would be, do we obtain a better outcome if this cataract extraction is combined with gonio-synecolysis? The third uh, would be, do we obtain a better outcome if cataract extraction is combined with endocyclophotocoagulation? And uh, the fourth um, would be, how about clear lens extraction? Are we there yet? So... So a little bit of a um, a little bit of a background. Uh, angle closure glaucoma we know is um, is the less prevalent uh, type of glaucoma uh, compared to the open angle glaucoma, it, but its contribution to vision loss and blindness is equally uh, significant. 0.6% um, of the general population has it, um, with six to nine uh, percent of patients of glaucoma, 
and an increased incidence of uh, 55 years or old. Um, so it tends to coexist with cataract. And sometimes we have the two problems um, presenting at this, within the same uh, patient. Um, eyes at increased risk for primary angle closure uh, glaucoma show a decreased axial length. So they're by nature smaller eyes with a proportionately larger lens. Um, the, uh, uh, the iris lens diaphragm is anteriorly situated, uh, giving us a small anterior chamber depth and resulting in a narrow uh, filtration angle. Uh, pupillary block has been, has been demonstrated uh, time and again as the main mechanism of uh, outflow obstruction in, in angle closure. But we, uh, we now know that there are other non-pupillary uh, block mechanisms that uh, can play a major uh, role. Uh, plateau iris configuration, peripheral iris crowding, as well as anterior uh, lens uh, positioning, or what we tend to call a high lens uh, vault. So um, for years and years, we've been doing laser peripheral iridotomy uh, to relieve the pupillary block, widen the angle, and bring down the pressure. Uh, and studies have shown um, that this can be effective. 100% of patients um, had a resolution of an acute attack after laser uh, peripheral uh, iridotomy. Um, but the problem is that six months after that laser iridotomy, 58% of these patients developed elevated intraocular pressure and 33% of them needed um, trabeculectomy. So, um, so that would be a problem. Even in, in chronic cases of angle closure, uh, patients with narrow angles after laser peripheral iridotomy were found to have up to 180 degrees of peripheral anterior synechia, um, causing uh, recurrent elevations of intraocular pressure. And that elevation of intraocular pressure has been correlated uh, to the amount of peripheral anterior synechia. So uh, PAS um, is a problem. The second problem would be um, uh, the plateau iris uh, configuration. Patients with narrow angles Again, after laser peripheral iridotomy, we found to have a high incidence of a plateau iris configuration as demonstrated by UBM. Um, and, 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 and these patients tended to show a high positive response uh, when subjected to the dark room uh, prone uh, position uh, test. So in short, uh, there, are three, there are forces acting at, on three anatomic uh, levels and, and they can predispose to angle closure glaucoma. At the level of the iris pupillary block, at the level of the ciliary body plateau iris, and at the level of the lens, high lens vault. Elimination of pupillary block by the iridotomy does not eliminate the impact of the other two uh, forces. And this is where cataract surgery comes in. It relieves the anterior chamber crowding. It helps uh, uh, deepening of the anterior chamber and widening of the angle and thus improves the facility of outflow of aqueous humor and decreases intraocular pressure and variations of intraocular pressure. Um, studies have, have shown uh, that uh, cataract surgery uh, subsequent to laser peripheral iridotomy was effective in reduction uh, of intraocular pressure and resolution of uh, angle uh, closure. Um, as well, um, here another study from Japan um, showed a reduced intraocular pressure of 30% uh, and a reduced number of, of glaucoma meds by one in, in um, angle uh, closure of glaucoma patients uh, with a survival analysis of 92%. So um, there are people who would even uh, propose that cataract surgery should be considered as the first option for treatment in a coexisting cataract and angle closure in glaucoma. Um, this is a, a video uh, courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Ike uh, Ahmed, um, and this is a, a, a case of a nanophthalmic uh, eye, which is considered the, uh, the holy grail for angle closure glaucoma, the extreme of the extreme. And uh, again, um, like uh, Dr. Chen um, uh, um, uh, mentioned, we do, um, uh, Dr. Chen mentioned, we do use a, a uh, a, uh, we place a, a, a 23 gauge uh, trocar uh, through a sclerostomy um, just to um, uh, maintain a unicameral uh, eye uh, in, in, in such a case. Um, so um, this is the technique that is known as uh, I need to uh, 
is on your hyalodectomy. And capsular axis is done and hydro dissection. The, uh, there is no really vitrectomy in, in, at, at that point. This is a, a regular cataract uh, surgery and vitrectomy comes in at a later uh, uh, phase of, of, of the procedure uh, after uh, a removal of, of the lens. Um, now, this is the most important maybe point in the surgery. Whenever an instrument is removed from the eye, care should be taken not to lose the anterior chamber. Uh, cases of, of uh, nanophthalmus are known for two major uh, problems, um, a um, uh, exudative uh, or sort of, uh, detachments, either, uh, either, either hemorrhagic or, or serous, um, and the other uh, problem would be uh, aqueous misdirection. So every time an instrument is removed from the eye, a reformation of the anterior chamber should be uh, maintained. The lens is placed and... Um, the wound is closed with pilo and the case completed uh, with no problems. Now, uh, tips uh, for that surgery would be uh, giving intravenous manitol uh, preoperatively, uh, uh, making sure that you have a long corneal uh, tunnel, uh, be, being very careful with the capsular axis. A large capsular axis is needed, but still uh, be careful not to lose it. Uh, low phaco power, remember you're very close to the endothelium and use adequate uh, vesicoelastic use. And in these cases, I tend to use uh, the, uh, a mix of um, cohesive and dispersive vesicoelastic in a soft shell technique. And uh, above all, avoid uh, flat uh, AC. Uh, now, if, if you want to supplement that with goniocyniculysis, so if, um, if we're dealing with a case of primary angle closure, unresponsive, uh, to treatment because of the extensive peripheral anterior synechia. Again, direct uh, viscoelastic injection uh, into uh, the angle of the anterior chamber. And then we can either use an iris repositor or we can use, uh, we can use a peeling uh, forceps at 25 gauge to release the peripheral anterior synechia from the angle uh, um, using a direct uh, gonio uh, lens. Uh, the, the important thing about, about the technique is to just exert a, a gentle downwards uh, vertical force uh, on the uh, peripheral anterior synechia. So uh, a downward force rather than a radial uh, force. And that would help uh, separate the synechia without inducing any uh, IV to dialysis. Okay, next uh, and um, this technique has been shown to be effective in both acute and chronic angle closures. And uh, however, the uh, lower uh, success uh, rate and then the higher uh, peripheral and clear uh, synechia reformation were reported in the chronic group. Um, the other would be, uh, the other um, technique that could be used is the endocyclophotocoagulation. Um, again, um, for advanced uh, cases with plateau iris configuration, uh, under viscoelastic injection, uh, diode laser uh, is applied on the posterior part of the ciliary processes until uh, a shrinkage is, 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 is noted. Um, and again, 180 degrees of uh, the circumference is, is usually uh, treated. Okay, again, that technique has shown uh, success and um, uh, the difference between uh, uh, when comparing it to transcleral has shown as a, 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 an equal effect, uh, though um, less in terms of complication uh, rate. Uh, final point uh, about clear lens extraction. And when we uh, uh, mention clear lens extraction, uh, we have to uh, mention the EAGLE study, which is a, a multi-centered study uh, that looked at the effectiveness of early lens extraction uh, for the treatment of primary angle closure of glaucoma. Um, the, um, the study did show that uh, uh, an initial clear lens extraction is the first line uh, treatment uh, for these cases uh, can be uh, of uh, benefit. And there was a one millimeter um, uh, lower uh, 
pressure in the lens extraction group, uh, but with 21% uh, 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 of, of the cases uh, needing further treatment as opposed to 61% in the iridotomy uh, group. And the study as well showed a better cost effectiveness um, and a less need for further uh, procedures. However, um, the study, as, as we know, is a multi-centered study with uh, maybe out of the six countries involved, uh, uh, four of them were Asian countries. So it needs to be kind of uh, uh, applied on other populations uh, before uh, validated. Um, again, the study is not known if, if it, it would work for uh, less advanced uh, cases of glaucoma. And again, longer term uh, follow-up uh, would be uh, needed for um, for the monitoring uh, progression. So back to the uh, questions, does cataract extraction help in resolving residual angle closure after laser peripheral Absolutely. Um, however, care should be taken uh, and, and uh, in, in, in terms of, uh, of the technique and precautions should be um, uh, dealt with. Um, do we better obtain, um, uh, do we obtain a better outcome if it's combined with coniosanipulysis? Yes, I believe so, especially in acute uh, cases uh, of, uh, of glaucoma. And we obtain a better outcome if it's combined with endocyclophotocoagulation. Again, yes, and with a, a, a markedly less incidence of complications. As, uh, uh, and when it comes to clear lens extraction, I do not think we are uh, there yet, but um, um, further studies will show us uh, the way. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. As we said, we postponed the discussion according to our time. Now, please, uh, Dr. Ahmed Asaf. Dr. Okay. Ahmed Asaf will start, he will start his uh, presentation. Can you, Dr. Ali, can you please uh, stop sharing presentation, please? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no problem. It was an excellent uh, one, by the way. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. I have stopped sharing. Okay. Okay, so I'm charged here to, uh, to talk about the cataract extraction in vitrectomized eye. And I don't have any financial disclosure in any of the subjects mentioned in this presentation. As you know that uh, um, the incidence of cataract after vitrectomy has been reported to uh, be up to 100% within two years after the primary vitrectomy. And the reason uh, of the cataract is not clear so far, but there are some predisposing factors, including uh, advanced age, life toxicity, intraoperative oxidation, and silicon oil, diabetes. But to my mind, I think that the mechanical trauma at the time of the primary vitrectomy, just touching the posterior lens capsule with the vitrector, might be the most important predisposing factor for cataract formation. And uh, so that's why it has been advocated to do primary uh, phaco vitrectomy, even if the cataract is not that dense uh, because of the high incidence of cataract. We have before the surgery, we have some bio biometrical challenges that include the uh, silicon oil. If the presence of the silicon oil in the posterior segment of the eye, this uh, silicon oil will slow down the ultrasound for biometry. That's why we give a falsely uh, a large uh, eye or longer and the axial lens. So correction factors should be uh, kept in mind. Uh, of course, optical biometry will uh, produce better results, but sometimes we cannot do optical biometry because of the density of the cataract. Another biometrical challenge is the hyper deep anterior chamber in the uh, vitrectomized eye, especially if these eyes are fluid filled, and this will cause a wrong assumption of the effective lens position, and that's why we mo most probably will have uh, uh, biometrical challenges in the term of false calculation of the effective lens position and the IOL power. Uh, it has been mentioned that the SRKT formula, which is less affected by the anterior chamber depth, is more or less the most accurate uh, formula that can be used in such context. Another uh, challenge, is, uh, which is the IOL consideration, because of the design of the IOL, because of the refractive index of the silicon oil, which is if uh, planned to be stay for a longer time inside the posterior segment of the eye, 
with the biconvex lens, this the anterior surface of the silicon oil will act as a meniscus lens, and this will cause diversion of the light rays inside the eye in the posterior segment, and this will again add to the, um, the difficulty in the measurement of the correct power of the IOL. And the best choice is the convex plan uh, IOL if it is available in the market or or in the area you are working in. Uh, of course, uh, there is high incidence of posterior capsular uh, rupture and, because, and weak zone in these eyes. So that's why we should uh, opt to a three-piece IOL in, uh, or at least keep the three-piece IOL as a backup lens in, uh, in the OR. And of course, we should avoid the silicon IOLs by any means. Regards the intraoperative challenges, with this, which is the main part of my talk today, we have many challenges intraoperatively. Uh, for, for example, we have insufficient mediasis, compromised red reflex that requires some time staining, hyper deep anterior chamber, excessive fluctuation of the anterior chamber, and excessive flaccidity, flaccidity of the posterior capsule, posterior capsular plaques, and high end of posterior capsular uh, rupture, and of course. PCO after the surgery is very high compared to the senile cataract. The hyper deep anterior chamber is caused by zonal relaxity and it's more pronounced in the fluid filled eye, not silicon filled eye, but again, it's present in the silicon filled eye. And this causes steep angulation of the phaco hand piece uh, during the uh, phaco emulsification, and this will compromise the technique and may necessitate low infusion pressure and low bottle height. Again, because of the same reason and because of the lack of the counter pressure from the vitreous in the posterior segment of the eye, we have excessive fluctuation or some pulling of the anterior uh, 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 chamber during the emulsification. And we can uh, go around this by prolapsing the nucleus outside the lens capsule in the anterior uh, chamber to do phaco emulsification. Or we can, of course, reduce the bottle height and infusion pressure. Or we can use the technology that I'm going to mention in a few minutes. Uh, as you can see in this movie, I'm here prolapsing the nucleus uh, after doing a relatively large rexis, I'm doing phaco emulsification in the anterior chamber to avoid fluctuation in the depths of the anterior chamber. Of course, we should use ample amount of dispersive OV to protect the corneal epithelium during phaco emulsification. Or we can opt to the technology. I don't have any financial interest. This is the white star uh, case chamber stability that uh, it's a source of automatic occlusion sensing mode. Here we can, the machine can sense the occlusion and drops the vacuum instantaneously and automatically to a lower level as if anticipating occlusion break and once occlusion break occurs, occlusion break occurs at a lower vacuum level, and this improves the stability of the anterior chamber. You can see this is slow motion video. I have preset the vacuum to 420 millimeter mercury, but the machine will drop the vacuum just before occlusion break to 340. This is the preset, my preset level, another vacuum setting. And just once occlusion break occurs, occurs at a lower vacuum level, and this minimize the uh, fluctuation of the anterior chamber to a great extent. Again, uh, we can use the technology of the centurion, which is known as active sentry. Uh, uh, this, uh, the handpiece now it's provided with a sensor that can continuously monitor the IOP inside the anterior chamber and continuously giving um, information to the motherboard, to the machine. So this, uh, the motherboard or the machine will actively infuse the fluid inside the anterior chamber, increase or decrease to they keep the IOP at a, uh, stable and then uh, minimize the fluctuation of the anterior chamber. You can see here, you can see this is the uh, a small uh, rectangle bar. It's fluctuating ups and downs at the, uh, the IOP. That means that the machine is increasing the infusion and decrease the infusion to keep the anterior chamber depth stable as stable as possible by active monitoring the IOP inside the eye, thanks to the sensors provided now within the handpiece of the FACO machine. Uh, again, we have the fibrous, the high incidence of fibrous plaque and hole during FACO emulsification, and this can be sometimes quite difficult to uh, examine or see in the preoperative uh, clinical examination. Probably ultrasound, B scan can detect the small break or hole. Uh, in the posterior capsule, but mostly or usually it presents as intraoperative surprise. Uh, that's why we should opt for sometimes to do the posterior axis to remove this fibrous plaque. 
or convert this hole if present into a more or less uh, posterior capsular axis. This is my last slide. This is the video that will summarize most of the points that have been discussing right now. Uh, this is a case of uh, vitrectomized fluid filled eye. You can see some remnants of the silicon oil, emulsified silicon oil in the anterior chamber under the dome of the cornea. It's quite common to see some remnants of the silicon oil inside the anterior chamber. It can be easily removed by injection of the dispersive and cohesive OVD uh, during the soft shell technique prior to rexus formation. And again, because of the high incidence of opening of the posterior capsule, uh, just keep the three-piece IOL as a backup lens. And here, while, while executing the rexes and trying to make the rexes as large and still allow for uh, the three-piece IOL implantation in the circus, just in case we have open posterior capsule and do the optic capture. So I'm trying here to keep my rexes uh, between five to 5.5 millimeter in diameter. So this is the sweet spot that we can do safe uh, fake emulsification and do optic capture just in case. Uh, I don't like to do hydro dissection in these cases. I treat it like a possible cataract, do gentle hydro delineation in multiple location and make sure that the lens has been completely free. And before entering the anterior chamber, we have to minimize the bottle height to reduce the infusion and to counter the effect of hyper deep anterior chamber. As you can see, I'm lowering here the bottle height before entering the anterior chamber. Regards the FACO technique, we can employ any technique as the surgeon wish, but I prefer the quick chop technique with vertical chopping. You can see that now the nucleus is pretty mobile within the uh, lens capsule. And uh, uh, because I believe that the vertical chopping is the least uh, stressful technique on the jeopardized uh, zone. And again, uh, we can lower the bottle height to make those fragments within the lens capsule more accessible. And once we have complete or done our chop, we can now raise the bottle height and we can retrieve those fragments from the lens capsule to the anterior chamber and do the FACO emulsification in the supracapsular plane. You can see here that we have still some fluctuation of the anterior chamber despite a reduction of the bottle height and the reduction of the vacuum. We can, of course, use the technology now again, again, as I mentioned before, that I have set the vacuum here to around 380 millimeter mercury. This is the rise up of the vacuum, and then the vacuum will drop instantaneously, as you can see here, to 267 millimeter mercury before occlusion. And this adds to the stability and minimize the fluctuation and trampoline effect of the anterior chamber in this eyes because there is no counter pressure from the uh, posterior segment of the eye. This eye is fluid filled and not silicon filled. Uh, uh, of course, we can, uh, if you don't have this uh, technology in your hands, you can lower the bottle height and do some sort of slow motion FACO, or you can just prolapse the whole nucleus inside the anterior chamber and do for your FACO emulsification with the protection of the coronary epithelium with the uh, dispersive OVD. And uh, you can see here, of course, uh, 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 just uh, keep the three-piece lens as a backup lens. Uh, um, we are not sure yet that we have an intact posterior capsule in, in this situation. And this is the last quadrant. We can raise the bottle height a little bit to facilitate or to improve the stability of the anterior chamber. I don't like to keep the anterior chamber uh, flat while switching the instruments. And now I just inject the dispersive OVD and then continue uh, for the next step by irrigation aspiration of the cortex. And as expected, as you can see, this is a fibrous plug. In center of fibrous plug and maybe interfering with the visual axis of this patient. This patient was single eye, by the way. So I'm trying to remove this fibrous plug with the, uh, the visco dissection. I failed. I'm trying to remove it mechanically with the uh, forceps, with the rexus forceps. But unfortunately, this uh, uh, turned into a break because most probably because maybe iatrogenic or maybe because the lens capsule is already jeopardized from the primary vitrectomy anyhow, we can just go uh, uh, forward and trying to convert this break into a uh, posterior rexus. I'm not surprised by this complication because I have already a backup three-piece lens in my hands and I made my rexus customized for sulcus implantation with doing the optic capture. Now I'm preparing for the lens to be implanted in the sulcus by injection of dispersive OVD between the anterior lens capsule and the iris and implant the three-piece lens inside the anterior chamber. Uh, 
And with the Cobain hook or the Sinisky hook, we can bring each haptic one at a time to place it in the sulcus in the proper uh, situation. Uh, uh, in the proper position. As you can see, this is the leading and then uh, trailing haptic. And this is the moment that I like them doing the optic capture. And as you can see, by doing the optic capture, the lens is pretty well centered and the rectus has been turned to elliptical in shape, denoting successful uh, uh, optic capture. Don't forget that uh, most of these eyes are highly myopic eyes and uh, maybe they have a large white wide diameter and the sulcus sometimes is larger than the overall diameter of the three piece lens. So it's preferable to do the optic capture uh, before a conclusion of the surgery. And sometimes the, these wounds in the main wound in these eyes are usually weak. So it's preferable to do a single stitch 10 or nylon suture to just uh, close the main incision for a few days that can be removed subsequently with no sequelae. I think uh, uh, I, I summarized most of the points that I want to discuss with this uh, movie. And thank you very much. I'm open for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, I believe also we'll postpone discussion because we have a lot of questions about all the topics. And uh, we invite Dr. Yuri, Yuri Taktai from, uh, from St. Petersburg. We will give his experience about uh, intermutant cataract. Thank you very Please much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramad, for your introduction. Let me check. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So we will talk about the intermission cataract and the the surgery, so the surgical removal of the intermission cataract presents several very special challenges for the surgery. Because the intermission lens has begun a lost structural integrity due to the protein is denaturated and the lens is becoming hydrated and the pressure inside the, 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 the crystalline lens is uh, increasing and, and the rich chamber shallowing and uh, the problem that if you just touch the capsule and you can have a high risk to explode. So how we can manage the intermission cataract to avoid Argentinian flex syndrome, uh, especially in um, uh, mature and happier mature cataract with the intermission material and the anterior capsule may undergo degeneration with the deposit of the calcium and development of the central dense plaque. And this is the case with a very dense plaque in the central area. And we try to, to, to manage the, the capsule. We try to reduce the, the pressure. This is the, this is the, and the manipulation with the capsule, we stain in the capsule to, to better visualization. And we try to open, and you can see that the, the, the capsule and the plaque are slightly separate. We remove the capsule very, very heavily. And this is the 360 degrees. Rex is, but the plaque still presents. We re reduce the capsule. And this is a just superficial part of the capsule because the plaque and the other uh, capsule are still present. And I just try to, to make the rotation of the nucleus. And you can see at six o'clock, still the capsule present. And we have a tube, yes, in this area. And the, the, the rexis is, uh, is not completed. So we just remove superficial part of the capsule. And so, and this is the problem. Uh, if you try to remove the plug with the ultrasound, it's not helpful because it's very elastic. You can see, this is the, try to remove with the ultrasound tip, just try to aspirate the plug. Now it's not helpful at all. I activate the ultrasound. This is the optional movement. It's, it's not effective. So, and we remove by the scissors and by the forceps this plug. We are going forward. This case full of the septrices because the 
color of the lamps look like the lamps is a very rock, white, brown cataract. And we remove the, remove the capsule. And still we have a, we try to use the chop technique and suddenly you can see, I spray the central area. The color in this case, not indicate that the nucleus presence and the nucleus grade doesn't depend from the color. So it's very soft material. And you just aspirate the material to the for a portion of ultrasound. And you can see the same uh, lack on the posterior capsule. So we just remove the material and at that time should we decide what to do with the, the posterior capsule because it's not only the central plug, the fibrosis is a go into the periphery. We remove the material. And this is the fibrotic capsule. Try to, to, to remove the residual part of the, of the nucleus. Just rotate and aspirate the, the periphery cortex. The, the pupil is not so wide, but four millimeter and a half, which is absolutely enough. No need to enlarge. It's better don't touch the, any mechanical stretching of the pupil, damage the sphincter. So, for sure, if you can manipulate with the small pupil, it's better than if you have some special device to enlargement. And you just look around behind the iris and you can see the strong fibrotic tissue. Check, check residual cortex as well. This is the surprise to me at 12 o'clock. This is the last piece of the cortex. And when we decide to remove this plug and keep the posterior capsule intact by the needle, we just separate the, the fibrotic tissue from the posterior capsule, polishing a little bit in the periphery. This is a traumatic case, traumatic cataract with intuition. And then capsule fibrosis, anterior posterior and capsule fibrosis. So there is no material in the periphery, and now we can focus to the posterior capsule. We can't leave, we can't to open the capsule by the normal way, like to, to from the posterior axis because the fibrotic tissue go to the periphery, so you have to control the opening. And we decide to remove the, the fibrotic tissue and try to separate them from the capsule. You can manipulate by the needle, just lift it up and slowly, slowly separate from the capsule. It's a very delicate procedure due to the capsule are very, very thin, especially for intervention this it's more fragile and this is a well, very lucky surgeon if you uh, finish the this without posterior capsule rupture. Fortunately for me, well, for this day, it was my day, so we just remove the, the, the fibrotic tissue from the capsule without any damage of the posterior capsule. And, this is the final step. You see the capsule is intact and it's easily separated from the we remove the okay. So for some cases the surgical trauma can cause the intumescent cataract. And this is the case one week after the corneal transplantation. I can see the crystalline lens, the cloudy and the intumescent. And this is the result of the rapid hydration, the op opacification of the, of the lens. So the anterior chamber is very, very shallow. And the problem that the cornea graft uh, 
very close to the capsule, so we, we should to manipulate um, under the viscoelastic to protect the cornea graft from the mechanical damage from the ultrasound or irrigation trauma. Separate the same here, staying in the capsule. Due to the absence of the red reflex, also one of the challenge to intermission cataract. And in this case, uh, we just to use hyaluron pipe, so the recall is a viscoelastic and we start to open the capsule with the small rexes. And this is also one of the points how to keep the control during the rexes. You can enlarge the rexes in the later stage or you can enlarge during the this step. So there is no need to hydrate because it's already hydrated. We just rotate the nucleus. And usually the nucleus is not very rough and you can aspirate it easily with a, with a very, very low energy. And aspirate the material. No need to chop, no need to groove in the material. Just stay in the central and aspirate the, the soft, soft material. There is no problem. Just what is important to the very shallow chamber, so to reduce all your parameters, to reduce the vacuum and reduce the flow rate to, to keep the, the table in cells. So um, the most critical step for intermission cataract for sure this is the REC system. And the, there are some several approaches how to improve the utilization, how to improve the control during this step. First, we should to compensate the high intralenticular pressure. So we should put more viscoelastic, try to avoid the manipulation through the main incision, the side ports, the uh, prevalence, and the, uh, we, we can also to reduce intralenticular pressure to remove uh, this water from the capsule by the needle or by the cannon. I'll show you. Next slide, the technique how to aspirate the anterior cortex and reduce the pressure inside the crystalline lens and you can manage with the capsule by the normal way. You just paint in the capsule, you penetrate by the needle and aspirate the cortex. And this is also the, the case of intermission. But in this case, the, this age-related cataract, the nucleus is not soft. This is a small but very rock nucleus. Uh, and we also penetrate the capsule by the middle. We try to aspirate the soft material. And it's with like the Morganian cataract. You will see the red reflex appeared, and the material disappeared, and this is a very small residual nucleus at the end, and also fibrotic capsule. And for this case, the which is not easy, for the capsule is a very fibrotic and it's very compromised for the zonalis. You can see this traction damage some zonos and finally we have a problem with the capsule fornix and uh, put the interim CTI in this case uh, and show you this step. Just, this is the step of the Nucleus removal. Just go forward a little bit. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and you can see this is a problem with the actual opponents and the CTI are very helpful for this case. And 
already explained that the capsule, even if you put the CPR, pastel capsule are very floppy and it is the high risk of damage of the capsule. In this case, we have the same problem with the pastel capsule and show you at the end. And this is the capsule defect and we also try to round it, uh, this defect and perform the primary rexis just to if the capsule back for in the back implantation. Sorry, Dr. Yuri, but we have two minutes left only. Uh, it's okay, we will finish. So this is another uh, option how to manage intermission cat trap. You can penetrate the capsule and create it a very, very small axis in the periphery. And this opening can be enlarged in the later stage. Just remove the, the small part of the capsule and aspirate the material by the cannula, so reduce the, the pressure inside the bag and you can easily manipulate later. So this is the trick how to manage with the information case. And for conclusion, the information cataracts present some special, very special surgical challenge that frequently has a successful outcome with advanced staining of capsule and increasing the automatic techniques. So we should use a special disc elastic, special forceps, and even if Argentine flex syndrome is present, we can keep control uh, and put the lens in the back. So this is the final slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yuri. Very interesting uh, presentation. Now, Dr. Mohammed Hisham Ali, Director of Maghrabi uh, Hospital Dubai and Glu Glaucoma and Cataract Surgeon, will give us uh, a talk about cataract surgery and uh, facomorphic glaucoma. Dr. Mohammed Hisham. Dr. Yuri, yes, can you please? Uh, here, yes. Um, actually, uh, yeah, I will share my screen. Um, I hope it is. Is it the same topic or you would? No, actually, because it's uh, the intermission cataract is just like the fecomorphic. So uh, I was preparing and then uh, I found out this very nice case. Is it? Uh, ah, here it is. Um, this, uh, can you see my slides? No, still not. Uh, okay. Uh, did you, uh, now, Dr. Uh, Yuri? Did, yeah, it's okay. Okay. So, okay. Okay, I will go on. So, uh, because of the uh, the intubation cutter is just like the fecomorphic cutter. So, when I was preparing the um, the talk, I found out this very nice case. Actually, it's a lens induced angle closure glaucoma. It's not cataract test, but it's a very uh, nice case. Okay. Ah, here it is. So, uh, so this is just like a case presentation, it's very informative for me and for the others, uh, I hope. This patient was referred to me by colleagues. She's a, a lady of 32 years old. She had a history of heart disease and she had thyroid problems. She was, she was taking thyroxine, uh, 75 milligram. She was taking Topamax for migraine. And then she had some sudden attack of bilateral, bilateral, uh, eye pain, foggy vision, tearing, intolerance to light with severe redness. Her doctor was found out that the, her uh, IOP was in the 50s with a very, very shallow uh, anterior chamber. Both eyes. Both eyes, both eyes. So um, she was given COSOPT, Alphagan, uh, and she said that the IOP, um, as I told you before the, uh, the pressure, before the treatment was in, in her 50s, uh, the gl her glasses before the attack was just astigmatic. She's plano uh, sphere, but nearly astigmatic. Uh, 
when I saw her, they, she, her vision was counting finger, uh, one and a half meter in one eye and 2400 uh, in the other eye. The cornea thickness was normal with the pressure and with the diamox, which was taken, uh, their, their pressure was uh, 23 and 20 millimeter, but, but very shallow anterior chamber still. Um, and she had the ciliary injection. Uh, the cup disc was actually normal. She didn't have, and this is her fundus uh, photography by the optus. You can see the, the uh, cupping is not that much. So she's not a chronic actually uh, glaucoma. Uh, you, the uh, OCT, the anterior, uh, anterior segment OCT found out that all the complex of the lens and the iris was pushed forward the, in both eyes. So it's, it's a similar. It's actually, it's uh, symmetrical in both eyes. Uh, the, visual, the visual field was done, it's, it's a diffuse uh, visual field loss, so it's not, nothing specular, special for the uh, glaucoma. This is her right eye, this is her left eye. It's diffuse, diffuse uh, loss of the uh, visual field. It's, we cannot interpret it to the glaucoma. Uh, so the diagnosis that I made was that she had a serio-corioretinal cor effusion from the use of uh, Topamax. And this is actually one of the complications that can hap happen to Topamax. Uh, it can cause uh, bilateral lens iris complex forward disp displacement. So what did we do? We stopped the, to the Topamax. Uh, we gave her prednisolone to just to quieten the eye, uh, continue on the uh, diamox acetazolamide. We gave her a cycloplegic. And this was the second day. Uh, you can see how, how she's high, high, uh, high myope now uh, with the astigmatism that she has. But the patient felt better. However, after a few days, the refraction went back to nearly her normal uh, refraction before. And the uh, AC become deeper now. The refraction went to back. The pressure with, of course, with the diamox and all, everything, was eight and 11. Uh, we advised to stop the alpha again and remeasure it after one week. The patient was uh, even with, without uh, the, uh, with the soft only, the IOP was seven uh, millimeter mercury in both eyes. The vision with her own correction uh, was 2020. Uh, so we advised to, to stop the COSOPT and remeasure it uh, after one week. She was fine and after one week she was fine. So uh, as a discussion, the complications of uh, Topamax is acute bilateral angle closure glaucoma and acute happening of myopia. Uh, and if we discontinue, just discontinue the, the Topamax, everything will go back to normal, but we, the patient has to be warned against using it again. Uh, the patient may still have to have uh, glaucoma medications but we have to be careful. So we have to be careful when withdrawing these um, uh, medications. Preferably, I don't mean these cases are useless. We cannot, it's not required. This patient is not an angle closure glaucoma. This is an, let's say temporary angle closure or temporary fecomorphic glaucoma. Uh, UBM is very helpful uh, if we have the uh, shallow anterior chamber. Uh, so a uh, macular try may happen with the uh, Topamax. This is complication that can happen with the Topamax to have an um, uh, macular star, which is usually temporal. The differential diagnosis of this case are uh, malignant glaucoma, uh, pupillary blood glaucoma, supracoroidal hemorrhage, serous uh, chorioretinal effusion. The differentiation, how to differentiate between them is when the, in the uh, malignant glaucoma, the pressure will be elevated uh, most of the time, while in the supracoroidal and choroidal effusion, the pressure will be low. The anterior chamber depths uh, in malignant glaucoma will be very shallow uh, all over, central and peripheral. Uh, in the uh, supracoroidal, uh, the, uh, the, cent the um, and, sorry, in the pupillary block, the, uh, the central part will be deep because there is a curve in the, uh, of the iris bomb base, so it will be deeper central and flat uh, uh, periphery. Uh, the egg resolves only the pupillary block, but doesn't resolve the other kind of, uh, of glaucomas. 
uh, fundus examination, of course, we can find it's, it's uh, we, we will find a bullous uh, choroidal effusion with the colors in the hemorrhage and the uh, choroidal attachment, while in the other in the malign glaucoma and the papillary block, it will be flat. UBM is very helpful in the first uh, in the malignant glaucoma papillary block, but of course, we cannot, uh, is we cannot, it cannot reach the choroidal uh, effusion and the hemorrhage. And thank you so much for uh, just listening to me. Thank you, I Dr. Mohamed Isham. Thank you very much. Interesting, very interesting. Uh, usually we have always facing unilateral angle closure glaucoma, but this is a case bilateral because of systemic reason. Uh, so you finish before the time. I hope that we have time later on for discussion. Now the last talk by Dr. Ahmad Musallam, head of department in the Russell Khima Hospital. And he will give his experience or his way of shopping anterior posterior phaco shop in extreme eyes. Please, Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed, I think you are mute. Dr. Ahmed, can you un unmute your? Please, Dr. Ahmed, can you are you are mute? Dr. Ahmed, can you hear me? You are mute, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Dina, can you unmute Dr. Ahmed, please? Dr. Ahmed Musallam. I think she unmuted me instead of Dr. Ahmed. So uh, there are various indications like Okay, sorry. You are hearing me now? Yes, we're hearing you. Yeah, you saw my slides? It's not working, okay. Okay, sorry for uh, the losing time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Imad. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, my talk today is posterior anterior shopping technique uh, for uh, FACO mystification. The most present uh, FACO chop technique perform anterior posterior chopping using sharp vertical choppers. In contrast, in contrast uh, pack is posterior anterior chopping using the flat curved and blunt Koch spatula. Different difference from a regular FACO chop is only the direction of uh, chopping. All other FACO parameters and rest of surgical steps remain the same. Uh, I will show you the spatula, what, what we are using, this Koch spatula. It's very humble uh, spatula available in the market. It contains from flat two surfaces, uh, flat surfaces and uh, lateral edge. Uh, this slide showing a uh, spatula position under the uh, nucleus with soft cataract, the flat surface facing the nucleus with moderate and hard nucleus, lateral edge facing the nucleus. We prepared uh, animation uh, video just to make uh, this technique more easier. To understand, we have a top view and wide, uh, 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 side view. Top view showing how inserting uh, the FACO tip in the middle of the, the nucleus and under high vacuum and occlusion, we are tilting and lifting the nucleus. And uh, side view showing how the spatula uh, inserting between the nucleus and epinucleus and how we are performing the uh, first chop. Uh, this is, uh, let us to see how it's uh, this technique coming with the real patient uh, with moderate cataract, uh, sorry. Uh, 
with the moderate cataract, as you see how we are uh, inserting the spatula under the nucleus and how we are performing first uh, hemisphere uh, uh, chopping, dividing to um, uh, small pieces and make it easier for emulsification. <clears throat> and as you see, second hemisphere, we are uh, tilting and moving it to the center and the same way we are using the spatula. It's very, it's curved and very safe to use it uh, during the fecomusification. Now a binoculus removal. As you see the spatula, position of the spatula between the fecal tip and the posterior uh, capsule uh, for, to protect the posterior capsule. With more harder uh, uh, nucleus, as you see the same way we are using to perform first chop and first hemisphere sub-chop. And as you see, we are uh, using uh, the spatula uh, to uh, crushing the material, the hard material, and make it, it easier to, for uh, uh, emulsification to minimize uh, ultrasound energy. And you see all small fragments we should to remove uh, first. Second uh, hemisphere, as you see with the spatula, how easy to divide it to two pieces and how we are crushing the material with the flat surface to make it uh, easier and smaller for fake mystification. And as you see all the time position of the spatula uh, between the phaco tip and the, uh, the, the posterior capsule, to avoid any touching from the posterior capsule and uh, between the posterior capsule and fecal tip with a binoculus removal. And again, you see the position of the, the spatula, how is working well to protect the posterior capsule. And this is giving chance to work faster and to make flow rate uh, uh, faster during fecomusification. And as you see exactly how the lateral face facing to to, to, to protect the capsule. With the, again, very hard cataract, first chop, again, how it's easy performing using the uh, lateral edge of the spatula. And as you see how we are crushing the FECO, the, the material to make it smaller and smaller for easier emulsification. And as you see, all the free fragments should be uh, 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 aspirated first to avoid any damage to the posterior capsule during the rotating the, uh, the nucleus. As you see again, the same way we are using the spatula, it's crushing the material, make it smaller, saving ultrasound, especially with the patient with heart cataract, to avoid any damage to the endothelium of the cornea. As you see, finish with the first hemisphere. All the small fragments should be aspirated also. Little rotation. And dealing with the second hemisphere as the first hemisphere. Very easy. And dividing all the a big material to the small uh, uh, pieces to easier uh, for emulsification. As you see how the spatula all the, all the time, it's uh, between the phaco tip and the posterior capsule, avoiding any rupture to the posterior capsule. Because you know, during our work, we have fluctuation of the posterior capsule. And this is the spatula, it's not sharp, don't have any uh, sharp end to, to, to damage the posterior capsule. And the, the, the curve is the same curve as the, the, the posterior capsule. And when we have any fluctuation, it's hitting the, the, the flat surface of the spatula. And it's very safe spatula to work with the during fecomusification. Again, with the epinucleus removal, you see the position of the, the, the spatula tracking all the time between the 
the uh, the fecal tip and posterior capsule. This, as you see, the patient without any epineclus and uh, uh, cortex. It's very. Uh, it's um, we don't have any protection now for the posterior capsule. The only the spatula working as the protector for the posterior capsule. Here also easy to uh, to uh, divide to uh, perform first chop as uh, previous cases, and how we are crushing the material to make it easy for emulsification. Uh, last case I have with the uh, weak zinules. Here we are working very slowly, like slow motion, because we don't need any pressure for uh, uh, to the uh, uh, weak zinules. And as you see, very easy to perform first shock. And again, the same way what we are doing, dividing first hemisphere to small pieces, to small, to small fragments to make it easier for aspiration. Here we need to be careful because we have bad zinules, weak zinules, and we don't need any pressure. We need to take all the, the, the hard material to the center of the pupil and to aspirate it piece by piece, piece by piece, we need to be uh, uh, to be gentle in this surgery. Again, second hemisphere the same, and we are moving, holding and moving the uh, nucleus to the center, uh, far away from the zinules to, to minimize the pressure to the uh, weak zinules. As you see, with the second hemisphere, slowly aspirating and using the spatula to minimize, to divide the pieces to make it easier and flu uh, do, uh, to aspirate it uh, very easily. Uh, next slide, uh, it will be uh, slow motion, I think, and have a time, Dr. Imad. Yes. Uh, next maybe. slide, uh, what uh, uh, we have, uh, I have before some question about we have, how we are inserting safely the spatula, and we just make a video uh, uh, with the slow motion just to show you exactly how uh, two hands working together to create space enough space to uh, insert the spatula in the place. And as you see, how we are performing and how we are keeping the epinucleus, moving the epinucleus uh, uh, material with this spatula just to create more protection to the, to the posterior capsule. And as you see, we called it manual mechanical, uh, uh, manual hydro, uh, my, manual uh, uh, dissection, which means we are just moving uh, with the spatula, the epinucleus. And as you see how we are setting uh, the fecal tip and we are moving the nucleus a little bit. And in the same moment, we are moving our uh, spatula under the nucleus and we are performing first, uh, first uh, chop. It's easy coming. It's a very safe spatula. It's uh, don't have any sharp edges to damage the capsule or iris or, uh, uh, and again, this next video the showing the same way what we are doing. All our technique, what we are working the same way. Uh, I want to stop this uh, video to back again to, the, uh, to save your time. So the position of the side port is now is opposite the main incision, yeah, right? Should should be minimum uh, ninety uh, uh, degree. Uh, it means if we are uh, main incision it, uh, in the nine o'clock, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, side uh, port should be in the ten o'clock. It means we have relaxing uh, hands to deal with this uh, with this technique. And we can call okay, the we shopping, can. we can call the shopping backwards, backward shopping. Uh, yeah, maybe <laughs> we can uh, name it like that, but uh, this is the, uh, the summary of our uh, back technique and you all saw all the steps what we are 
uh, doing during the, our surgery. Uh, advantage, as you saw, we can use this uh, technique with uh, all kinds of uh, cataracts. And as you see, we using uh, this uh, uh, technique uh, successfully with the uh, uh, weak uh, zinules. Uh, no need uh, special, uh, 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 very big pupil uh, size to uh, perform this uh, technique. About the capsular excess also, um, because we are working uh, in the middle of, in the center of the pupil, also, we can uh, manage with small uh, uh, capsular excess. Uh, this is also a very important tool for uh, myopia and post vitreptomy eyes, because just we are holding the lens and we are uh, uh, making uh, the the um, the anterior chamber. Uh, I mean, we are holding uh, the, the nucleus and in the, in, the, in the level what we need, because we are holding it. Uh, um, the, the, the next slide showing uh, BCR uh, during uh, the, this technique, in the last uh, 714 cases, the BCR rate uh, during the nucleus removal uh, with back technique, it's uh, 0 0.0. Uh, 0 0.7 percent, it's mean five cases in 714 uh, surgeries. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. It's a very interesting uh, uh, way of shopping. And uh, uh, I think we have time, maybe uh, 10 minutes or less for discussion. And uh, for the first presentation of Dr. David Chang, he presented uh, a very uh, important uh, 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 maneuver in uh, managing of uh, uh, shallow, very shallow acute chamber, vitreous step. I want to uh, discuss this point with uh, our uh, uh, professors uh, like Dr. Ahmad Asaf and Dr. Yuri. Uh, do you think, do you, are you doing the same Dr. Ahmad Asaf in a very, are you doing this uh, way? Yes, uh, I'm doing this, but I try to avoid it as much as I can because uh, it carried a high risk for injuring the posterior capsule. And I did it myself iatrogenically sometimes, even if you direct the retractor or the spatula or the MBR toward the optic nerve, because these are very crowded eye and the anatomy inside the eye is bizarre and with a large lens. So there is high possibility to injure the lens while doing the vitreous step. So I'm doing this technique, but I'm trying to uh, over uh, or get around this by manitol, intravenous manitol. I'm trying to do some mechanical pressure the, just before the surgery to re reduce the, uh, the pressure inside the eye, use the high viscosity OVD like the Helon 5 if available. Uh, if uh, every day, uh, thing measure failed, so or probably uh, if uh, I anticipate that these measures will not do the job, I will do, of course, with your staff. Very nice. What, is, what do you think, Dr. Yuri? Uh, Dr. Mad, I lost the, the, the beginning of the presentation of the first case, so oh. there is no oh. discussion from my side. Okay. I uh, connect with it later on. Sorry. Okay, Dr. Chang, uh, do you have any comment on what Dr. Ahmad Asaf said? Yeah, no, I think these are extreme cases um, and you, you just have to keep in mind uh, that this is not what you normally do with a pars plana anterior vitrectomy where we tend to go anterior, aim, actually aim for where the lens is. And I think if you do go straight back toward the nerve, <clears throat> you can also turn the cutting port away from the lens uh, you should be able to avoid it because you're really coming in uh, at the level, uh, you know, really at the uh, lenticular plane, you're really going through the sulcus. But, um, you know, this is clearly something that everyone will be comfortable with. Uh, if you've done pars plana anterior vitrectomy, uh, it's a little bit easier. I think that um, the other approach would be to simply do a manual small incision extra cap. <clears throat> and uh, it's just the problem is that sometimes, as I said, these eyes are a little more prone, uh, as was mentioned uh, you know, by Dr. Hafez, that you know, supracortical hemorrhage is a, a bit more of a risk or infusion. So being able to keep a small uh, incision is always nice. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I have also a question to, uh, I think this is a question to Dr. Yuri from the participants. Uh, uh, do you think the usage, Dr. Yuri, for in case of milky cataract, do you think uh, the usage of negative pressure and do aspiration increase the dislocation of capsule comparable with that is done classically? Dr. Yuri, please. Uh, no, the step when we try to aspirate the material before we open it, the capsule, this is just to reduce the pressure and to compensate the pressure in the anterior chamber and interlenticular pressure. In case if it's in, inside the, uh, the, the capsule back, the pressure is very high and you just touch the capsule, uh, this is a high risk for the explosion. And the Argentina flex syndrome is one of the problems which happened in the early stage of the cataract removal. So we try to reduce the pressure first, and then we try to open the capsule. Thank you. And it's very, very helpful. So you can manage by the different manner. You can start with the opening with a small axis, or you can penetrate by the needle and aspirate by the same needle, or you can create very small axis and aspirate by the cannula. So it doesn't matter what technique do you use, but the principle, reduce interlenticular pressure. Yes, thank you very much. You. Uh, we have two glaucoma surgeons in, in our session, Dr. Ali Hafiz and uh, Dr. Mohammed Hisham. I invite them uh, if they have any uh, uh, discussion with their uh, presentations. Um. Dr. Ali? Oh, yes. Um. I mean, again, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, highlight the, um, the, uh, the now trend uh, for um, uh, tackling uh, cataract and angle closure of glaucoma with uh, cataract extraction without uh, going into filtering procedures. Um, more and more, we are, we are doing that uh, now. Um, the, uh, the two... Um, Hello, Mohammed. Uh, the two problems I, I, I kind of mentioned uh, that tend to follow angle closure glaucoma are the persistent or residual uh, peripheral pyrosynechia as well as the uh, um, persistence of the uh, uh, iris, uh, plateau iris configuration. One of them, uh, the first, is dealt with using goniosyneculysis. Uh, the second is dealt with uh, using endocyclopotocoagulation. Um, this is this is basically the approach we, we tend to take uh, for such cases. Um, the second point is uh, what I've mentioned about uh, the Eagle study and clear lens extraction. And I'm still not at a comfortable level to use, uh, to, to extract clear lenses to treat glaucoma. Uh, I think uh, we need to kind of um, uh, reapply that study on different populations and on different stages of glaucoma before uh, before we kind of um, uh, use it, and um, uh, but it is a, a step, uh, and and this is how research is done, it, one step at a time. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Ali. Thank you for uh, everybody shared in this session. Uh, uh, it was very informative and interesting, and because of the time, we have to conclude it now. Uh, we have a, sorry, Dr. Yes. Ahmad, we have a yeah. company symposium for SOFI. Yes, we'll start now uh, this symposium, SOFI symposium. Please, Dr. Roger. Can you unmute Dr. Roger? Yes, Dr. Ahmad. Can I just Good introduce evening. the Dr. Roger first because we have a communication with the, before the, the SOFI machine will be introduced on the market. We have a, a short introduction and uh, I would like to use this opportunity to introduce this Sophie machine. It's a new platform from the Switzerland. And the, the Roger, he's the chief of the sale manager of the company, of the AG. And uh, Roger, please, uh, what is the innovation you prepare for the, for the surgeons? Because not every year, we, we, we received the new innovation platform. Uh, yep. what, the, what the news from your side, please? Can yeah, you make good. a reduction? Well, good, good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yuri, for the introduction. 
Uh, I would like to use also this opportunity to thank the panel and the Mar Vision for enabling me, enabling me today to present at the Kasumi uh, of Talma uh, uh, conference, international conference. Uh, in the next minutes, I will like to use this opportunity to introduce our uh, uh, new FACO system, uh, Sophie. Um, my name is Roger Weber, and I'm the head of sales at the FACE AG. Uh, Sophie is the brand of our device and stands for Swiss Ophthalmology Innovation. Well, who is Sophie? Uh, Sophie is, uh, is, is not an evolution, it's, it is a, but a revolution. It's not a simple adjustment of an existing technology. It is meant to be a, a complete innovation. Uh, we spent uh, many years developing the device and uh, I'm gonna share with you some of the new, uh, interesting aspects uh, of this machine. Uh, but most important is that the smallest details which have been designed with a very specific goal is to make the work of the ophthalmologist and the surgical team more mobile simpler, safer, and finally more efficient. Um, well, I'm gonna show you here on this slide, uh, there are, uh, uh, you see two models, but in fact are three. The Sofi Premium and the Sofi Echo are two variants for more customized solution, uh, um, matching with the doctor requirement. And the Sofi A is, let's say the small version, the tabletop device, uh, however, all these three systems feature almost similar technology when it comes to uh, simplicity and safety. And uh, I'm going to move here to show you the, the Sofi A, which is a, a portable device. It's uh, easy to carry uh, with, the, with, the, with the trolley. Um, but mainly, if we want to focus on the three pillars of the Sofi, uh, it's the mobility, simplicity, safety. Due to the shortage of time, I'm going to uh, share with you some aspects related to the mobility and especially, which is most important for you, is the safety. Uh, well, the first, the first impact you see on the machine is that it is the first battery-powered FACO device. You can work completely independent with integrated battery throughout the surgery day without any need of electrical uh, supply. Uh, also, we are, the purpose is to eliminate all the cables and the tubes, which are very often disturbing you in your daily routine. Um, and therefore we have also eliminated the cable, the tubes for the compressor because uh, of the air supply, because we have integrated compressor for the venturi and the anterior vitrectum. Moreover, as part of the mobility and the flexibility to position the machine at any place you want, gives you that flexibility to, uh, uh, to, to position and to work at your convenience. And last but not least is we have the wireless foot pedal uh, with the induction charging. So even here, you don't need a cable to uh, charge the uh, foot pedal. So this is an interesting aspect about the mobility, but I think uh, I'm gonna focus in the next minutes, mainly on the safety aspect, and in particular, the triple pump fluidics. This is something really unique here because Sophie feature three pump system in one device. And three, the, one, the first pump system is the IOP control pump, which is meant to be to, to, as, uh, for stabilizing the infusion, the infusion pressure in order to maintain the anterior chamber stability of the eye. There we have also the peristaltic pump to control the flow and the vacuum and a very interesting uh, uh, pump, Venturi pump, we call it clean Venturi pump, uh, which protects ad against any contamination with the patient's eye fluidics. I'll come to that in a minute. There you see a very lean cassette, but the complexity lies in the system. So in this cassette, you, there, there are you know, a number of sensors, valves, membrane, barcodes, and, and here you have all three pumps in one. So this is what you see here, the front part, is the peristaltic and the active infusion, and the, the, uh, the other part is the venturi. So uh, coming to the IOP control pump, I'm gonna spend a few minutes here. Um, this, the new solution we have in our SOFI is that the pump usually compared with the, with the gravity pole, 
which is uh, very often when you use high values of vacuum, it might lead to instabilities of the anterior chamber. Uh, we have solved this by integrating the IOP pump, which is calculating and compensating the, uh, uh, the loss in pressure in the tu infusion tubing, as well as the ir irrigation aspiration tube. So as soon as the pressure drops in the eye, the IOP control, which is a roller pump, which is nothing else than, the, than an, an, a second peristaltic pump, increase its rotation and therefore the irrigation flow to keep the IOP stable. So the IOP control pump is extremely fast and therefore it maintains your requested IOP in the eye constant throughout the surgery. What, how is the mechanism of the, uh, of the IOP control pump? So when, when the IOP drops in the eye, um, the, the, pressure, the, the pressure due to occlusion break, for example, the, the pressure drops in the irrigation tubing. And in the cassette, we have a sensor, built-in sensor, which is uh, where, where the, the IOP drops as well. And automatically, it gives the order to the IOP to the IOP control pump to rotate faster, to go at full speed in order to maintain the IOP. And the whole process takes only a few milliseconds. So the second pump we mentioned is the standard peristaltic pump for a, a, a vacuum and flow control uh, of aspiration. But also nowadays, very interesting is to highlight that we have also the, with the clean Venturi pump, as you can see on that slide, there is a blue membrane and that separates the patient liquids from the external air supply or the, vent or the external air uh, uh, coming from the, from the uh, compressor. And therefore there is no risk for contamination. There is, because the patient liquids is all the time separated from that, uh, uh, from that compressed air. And therefore, there is no risk that that compressed air, which is usually in, in, un, un, unlike other machines, you know, touching this patient liquid and, and if a, somehow is, 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 uh, is uh, blown into the machine or into the surgical environment. So that gives that protection for the uh, surgical stuff too. So these are actually my few words I wanted to share about the SOFI. Um, there are, of course, certainly much more to, to know about. And therefore, I would like to invite you to visit our website, www.sofi.info, to learn more about our new vehicle generation. Thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you for inviting me again to this panel. And wish you a nice evening. And if you have any question, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Roger. Uh, Dr. Yuri, uh, I believe uh, uh, you, you use already this uh, machine. Can you unmute Dr. Yuri, please? Dr. Yuri, you are mute. Sorry, Dr. Imad, this machine is available in Arab Emirates. Uh, yes, this machine is going to be available in the UAE um, in next next months. We've already we've already sold uh, this machine. We're already available in many markets across Europe, Middle East, uh, mainly Asia Pacific, and a couple of your Middle Eastern country. Uh, but the machine is coming next month to Dubai. I mean, I mean, it's, as as a as a demo, uh, just we can use it to see how it's uh, it's look yes, like exactly. fine. Oh, Everything's sure. okay, but we need just to try it. Sure. Absolutely, that's the reason sure. why we are bringing it over, of course. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Yuri, you were mute. Happy. When we ask you about your experience with this machine, you're mute. Do Dr. Madsen, still I haven't experienced, I just have an introduction from the Roger, and I won't taste the machine, I, I won't try. And due to the, the stability of the anterior chamber, this is the new top, uh, and we, we have some very advanced technology from Alcon, with the active sentry with the same reason. So we can reduce intraocular pressure and stabilize, stabilize the anterior chamber at the same time. So it is a very, very important step. So, and it's very interesting how this pump for the irrigation line can uh, compensate the post-occlusion surge and uh, can we reduce the 
intraocular pressure during surgery uh, to the normal range. Uh, most of the doctors to perform the surgery today on the rock eye, you know, the very firm eye, and it's not good for for for, for the for the blood flow uh, circulation and the central vision atrophy, and it's a, a very very interesting uh, in technical idea how to improve the stability. So we will see in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Can we conclude, please, because we yes. are already behind the time. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thank everybody. Thank you very much. For the speakers and Thank participants. You. Thank you. Thank you very See much. You. Thank See you on the next occasion. Thank all you the much. best for all, but. Bye-bye. Yeah.